Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. My guest today is Ray Arata, the co-founder of the Better Man movement based in San Francisco. His company helps organizations focus on going beyond establishing equity and equality between the men and women they employ by pursuing partnership that creates powerful synergies by leveraging the differing competencies of men and women. He's recently written and published the book Showing Up, How Men Can Become Effective Allies in the Workplace. I was originally hesitant to take on this guest because I know that this is a very hot topic and I try to avoid hot topics. However, I know that it's something extremely important and I believe in his message wholeheartedly because what I experienced working in Asia was far worse than what a lot of people experience in America where he's from and where he focuses on. However, he is also aware that this is a global problem. So I felt like it was something I needed to do to start a conversation with a more global audience to understand that what's happening in workplaces all over the world is not okay and it's time that men are more open about including women in conversations giving them opportunities and while i've definitely seen female entrepreneurs and female leaders in larger organizations in asia and i'm very happy for that a lot of asian societies are male dominated and so it's definitely a problem that warrants discussing in this episode you'll hear Things like how do you discover that there's problems in your organization? How can you handle people being hesitant to report problems? How to handle people being unwilling to acknowledge that there's problems? And much more. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Ray Arata. Let's get to it. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. I appreciate it. I think it's really important for this conversation to be had. And I'm glad that you're one of the people that's driving the conversation, at least in America. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? What made you want to get into this and what it is that you do? I am a white, cisgendered, heterosexual man who has a big heart, who considers myself forever an ally in training because in the work that I do, we don't get to call ourselves an ally. Somebody who represents or comes from a historically marginalized group will so bestow that upon us. I'm a father. I'm a cyclist. I'm an activist. I'm all about gender equality, equity, and inclusion. And I'm the founder of the Better Man Conference. And most recently, uh, my second book, Showing Up How Men Can Become Effective Allies in the Workplace, is a, was a labor of love. And it's I was just published uh, in January. So that's the short version. I herald from an unusual place, which is a place of men's work. I've amassed probably 15,000 hours of working with men on how to live and lead from the heart, mainly from the Mankind Project, insofar as leading experiential, healthy initiations into manhood around healthy masculinity. And all that work that I did, including going into uh, maximum security prisons, I took all that which I learned and brought it into the ally and inclusionary leadership space and men have been hungry, hungry for it. Why do you think men are hungry for it? Because they tell me. Because after all those hours of working with them, men are coming up to me all the time. Now, in the context of corporate leadership and the corporate world, when we look at Time's Up, Me Too, the pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement, they've all come together to form a perfect storm. And so currently present day, there's a tremendous amount of attention on the majority of men. 
because there's been a minority of men, what I call the bad apples, the ones we see in the news, et cetera, the, the ones that have fallen from grace that have historically been controlling the narrative. And so right now, more than ever, men and organizations are like, how do we engage the men in our diversity, equity, inclusion efforts? Men are asking, what do I do? And then there's a whole groupings of men that we can talk about inside orgs that are still and in, in, in sitting in a lot of questions. And then finally, anybody that doesn't identify as a man, women, people of color, people you know from the LGBTQIA community, binary, non-binary, they're all curious and they've been at the affect of some of this behavior. So they want to support and be supported. Why do you think men felt it was okay to do what the, these bad apples, of course, not everyone's like that, but f- why do you think this subset of men felt it was okay to treat people as non-equal? A lot of answers to that. Um, if you think about the, what I call, uh, and I want to give credit to Paul Kibble and Tony Porter, the man box, those set of unwritten rules on what it means to be a man that drive our behavior. A lot of men just were doing it because other men were doing it because their father, their grandfathers were doing it. And we all had blinders on. We are unaware of the impact and how it was landing on other people. We weren't feeling the pain out of sight, out of mind. So when women galvanized and other groups started to galvanize, you know, I'm 59 years old this coming Saturday. So you start looking at younger men and I don't know how old you are, Sean, but you know, the younger men look at guys my age and they're like, I don't want to be like those guys. So there's a growing constituency that aren't okay with, with that behavior. And so we all got a pass for a long time. And that those times are over. The TV show Mad Men is probably a good example of those things. And I spent a lot of time with my grandfather growing up. He died a year ago. He was 88 when he died. And I think he was a living example of things that don't work today. Mm -hmm. Yes. He was hilarious and very outgoing. He was someone that I think a lot of young men would look up to because of his confidence and because of how he lived his life. But when you went deeper into it, there were elements of racism and misogyny and things that I don't think he did it because he wanted to hurt people. I think that's just the way society was. And so you were talking about men's identity and how they see themselves in society. And I think that that's just how society was at the time, even though the interesting thing is, if you look at society at that time, women were working post-World War II. They were already seeking freedom. I think that was really the, the start of or maybe the start of the second wave of feminism, where maybe the first wave was the early 1920s before suffrage was granted to him. Exactly. So I, I think it was interesting because he was coming into his 20s at in the early 50s during that time when women were becoming stronger and all that, but society was still trying to put women back into the home after World War II was over and the men came home. So I think he struggled with that. And I think a lot of men probably struggled with that. Um, And so when I talk to a lot of men in their 70s and 80s, it's uh, very interesting the way they think and talk and act. Mad Men is a glimpse into the past. If you want to see toxic masculinity displayed, watch Succession, because you have the patriarch, the character's name is Logan, and his kids, his sons, and, and everything in between in current day. And so that's a, another show of how they step into model, perform, act the way they think they're supposed to act according to men, starting with the patriarchal figure. You know, it's it's pervasive, pervasive. And it's just, it's not working for anybody anymore. A lot of men aren't into it either, you know, except the ones in power and that growing group of men that have power, you know, the light's being shined upon them. And there's a different way. And they just aren't aware of it yet. I think Trump's a really good example of toxic masculinity as well. And when he was running for president in 2016, I looked at his election campaign and I was like, how does anyone, I mean, this was before any of the other revelations and all the things we've learned about him in the the ensuing years, just from the campaign alone, it was baffling to me how anyone could like him as a human being or support him. Well, he gave voice to a vocal minority that were afraid didn't feel included, right? And he 
he heard them. And that is what, that's just my personal opinion. I'm not condoning what he did, but be that as it may, that's just my two cents on that. What's the first thing you do when you work with a new group of people? It really depends on the situation. So like when companies reach out to me, one of the questions I ask them is, where's the pain? And I just had two calls this morning. Is there a recognizable pain by senior leadership? That And that pain could be, we're losing a lot of people. We're not able to retain our talent or two executives screwed up and they step down and there's a black cloud hanging over us right now, right? Or is it your company at the place of seeing the possibility, meaning they don't have big pain, but if they chose to look under the hood and find out how women were experiencing the men at the company and how people who herald from historically marginalized groups were experiencing, and they chose to hear that, and they wanted to be able to attract, retain, recruit people, and they see the possibility of being a leader in the space, those are two very different scenarios of how I and my company can be engaged. I'll give you one example, the Hearst Company magazine, one of their leaders stepped down due to allegations of sexual misconduct. And this was a wake up call for the company. And they chose to answer it in a good way, as opposed to sweeping it under the rug. They sponsored the Better Man Conference. They asked us to put together a training for 70 individuals so that they could nip this in the bud and change the course of how people were inside that culture, right? So that's that's one example. Another example is a large company, you know, like Price Waterhouse, where they signed the CEO signed a pledge to be part of the He for She initiative. And as part of that He for She initiative, they asked us to put together a healthy masculinity webinar series, you know, some content to support the men in their org. And then they sponsored the conference and things along those lines. And there's, you know, and then I understand that a lot of your companies are smaller. So a company like Fandom, a much smaller company there in the, the fan gaming space, um, their CEO is a cycling buddy. He's a white cisgendered guy who has a kid in transition, who has spoken at our conference, bought my books, sent people to the conference. So he's walking the talk. And he's gotten, and he has a big constituency in Poland. So this is beyond the U.S. This notion of men isn't just a U.S. centric thing. There's some cultural differences, but it's still at the end of the day, you know, men are still in charge. Two questions just kind of came to my mind and they kind of go in different directions. So I'm going to go on a tangent real fast and say, I know that there have been a lot more allegations in the past of misconduct, misdeeds, uh, what have you surely there's a percentage of them that the allegations are fake that someone maybe just wants attention i i I have to say it i know that there's real problems but i also know that there's a subset of people that want attention what happens to the career of someone when these allegations are false not the person making the allegation but the person who's been accused and how do you handle that or how do you rehab that person's career One of the things I've learned to do when someone speaks to an experience that they've had at the hands, not literally, but as a result of an experience with a man, is the one thing you don't want to do initially is defend, invalidate, make light of their experience. And most people, you know, when men are accused, okay, the first thing we want to do is defend whether we're guilty or not. And if an individual man is at the affect of an allegation, there's a way he can conduct himself, right? Now, per your example, if it's untrue, like if this was me, if I put myself in in those shoes, I would still, um, without admitting any fault, I would seek to understand, like, please tell me, what did I say? What did I do? Acknowledge if I did that, that it landed on you, maybe make an empathic statement that, you know, I'm sorry that this happened to you, but under no circumstances, you know, if if it didn't happen, I mean, it could have been something I said, but if it was like a sexual allegation that I, I touched somebody inappropriately, I give counsel to guys, you know, like when they're in this situation, like you got to tell me the truth, what happened? If this happened on your watch from an accountability perspective, what did you have to do with it? 
So th- there's no easy answer to your question. And your your question was like if somebody was falsely accused, right? I have yet to see one of those. That is more of a fear. And then even with, even with the fear of that potentially happening, what I say to women and men and companies, I said, we're in this weird space where understandably women and marginalized folks are upset. They're tired. They haven't been listened to and they've galvanized and they've come together. And that's why when you look at Time's Up, Me Too and the Black Lives Movement, the pendulum has swung the other way. And in this period of time, uh, some men are going to get their heads chopped off, metaphorically, for misdeeds, regardless of the largeness or the minuteness of the infraction. And so that's an unnecessary thing that happens, but it's also necessary until the attention on the majority and men start to understand the way we've been doing things isn't okay anymore. So let's personalize each of us and start thinking about how we can speak and act differently. So what we don't want to do is lose sight of the bigger picture, right? I could go off on a tangent on that, but hopefully that uh, correlates to your tangent and maybe answers part of your question. Yeah, it does. Now, I know your focus is on helping men to understand, but I I think there's also a part that I feel obligated to mention, which is that it's not always that women are the ones who are being hurt. There are men who are hurt as well. And I think um, there are examples of them, uh, even in Hollywood, male actors who've been abused by other men. Yes. There's also instances in which women were the aggressors. They were the person on top and they took advantage of uh, another woman or another man. So, you know, I, I think it's only fair for the audience to understand that this isn't just a man on woman problem. This is men to men and women to women and, you know, women to men as well. It's it's every situation. It happens in, in all instances. If we pop outside of the corporate context and you and I are just talking about human beings and healthy masculinity... In my 55 plus weekends and my prison work, most people would be surprised how often men are victims of sexual abuse. It's very real. It's very real. And when we look at the man box and all the rules of how we have historically and societally subscribed to what it means to be a man, not only does that negatively impact other, it doesn't work for men either. So when you look at you know, depression, suicide rates, the shootings, a lot of this happens at the hands of young men uh, because they haven't had any training or outlet to experience their emotions. So they stuff it and stuff it and stuff it until there's an explosion. So I'm with you completely that, you know, men are suffering. But in the corporate context, if we look at companies and who's historically in charge and we look at the, the, the numbers, what we're really trying to do is to get this majority of men to galvanize together to stop the minority of men from controlling the narrative. And each man, if you fall into that majority, needs to ask yourself, do I want to be a better man? How do I want to be experienced by other people? People I work with, the people I'm in relationship, what kind of model do I want to be? And maybe there's this rewrite of what it means to be a man for each of us, healthy masculinity, which is kind of If we take and we look, put a positive spin on that, that's what I want to ultimately shine the light on and encourage as many men as possible. The reason why we haven't seen the changes we need to see in gender equity and gender equality and the amount of victims from sexual abuse and verbal abuse, emotional abuse at the hands of men is because so many men have, you know, looked the other way or said, this is not my problem. I'm not one of those guys. And we tacitly allow it. Uh, by our silence. So the same thing's true right now in the workplace. You've just mentioned something very important. From the other point of view, the silence is what the problem was, is that people who have faced abuse, whether it's physical or sexual or psychological, they're afraid to say something for fear of it ruining their career or for being judged or whatever reason they have. 
when you allow those things to happen to you without feeling it necessary to tell someone, maybe you're embarrassed that it happened, that you allowed it to happen or whatever. You're enabling that person to continue their pattern and you're enabling the culture to not change by not stepping forward and saying, this is what happened. And I think it's really important that for change to happen, the people who've been abused have to be willing to talk about it. And it's hard for them to do. I'm very fortunate. I have never been abused before. I've had a very great parents and a great family life as a kid growing up and great mentors who never touched me in any untoward way. And so, you know, I, I don't have a lot of, I think, issues that other people might have if they had grown up with those issues. And after leaving America and, and living in other countries and talking to people, realize that sexual abuse or psychological abuse is very, very common. It's almost as if like I'm an alien because I didn't experience it. Well, in that case, Sean, one of the things I've learned facilitating men around this work is psychological safety is hugely important. What people like you and I don't ever want to do is to put the spotlight back on them and that event. And when a man is willing to, and we're getting outside of the, the, the corporate scope here, but this is the work that I have done for years. And a man who, or even a woman who's had that happen to them, they make decisions about themselves at a very young age and they create survival strategies to keep themselves safe until such time when they're in their, an adult, those don't work anymore. And so it's a very complex web of issues that if you're not trained or understand, then it's, it's not a place that for you and I to go. I mean, I've done a lot of it. So, you know, I know enough to know how much I don't know. For sure. So the second question that I had to go kind of back towards the corporate side is being the leader of a company, how can you become aware that there might be a problem internally? So for example, my company is remote. If someone's treating another employee badly, it's hard to hear about it. You can't walk through the halls of an office and see see it happen or, or hear whispers of it. How do you build a culture where it's not acceptable and monitor that, or even if you don't monitor it, kind of make sure that people are treating each other correctly. So for you or any of your listeners, you have to be the change you want to see. You have to be that safe model. So for the your listeners who present as white male, it's about taking your head out of the sand and looking at what's going on in the world and asking yourself the hard questions are you doing everything you can to create a true sense of belonging for everybody in your org? Are you willing to ask the questions of women and marginalized folks of what it's like to be in this company? And when you ask that question and they share their lived experience, can you hold it? You might feel some emotions. And if what comes through you is, I had no idea, what can I do? You're headed in the right direction. <laughs> If you defend, deflect, and give them the Heisman, then you're heading in the wrong direction. You have to decide to get interested and to ask the questions and then to hear the answers. And then, okay, what am I going to do? I call that ownership-driven accountability. Is this happening on my watch? And am I willing to commit to do something to affect a different result? So a lot of this is kind of coming to a head right now in a lot of companies. I mean, I had two calls this morning with two different women, actually over the last couple of days, both women, both in the midst of large organizations being betrayed, bullied, not listened to at the effect of command and control by men. And even as learned as they are, they need me to come in because I look like those guys. I sound like those guys and I know how to compassionately meet with them where they are and to ask the very questions I'm putting to you right now so I can raise their awareness so they can decide for themselves, is this how I want to lead in this company? What's at stake? What if word got out that it's not safe to be at this company and people start leaving? Whatever your thoughts are of running a successful company, guess what? You're in jeopardy. I was thinking of hiring a psychologist to be full-time on staff for anyone in the team to be able to communicate with. If the person on staff recognizes there's something going on that they should tell us so that we can do something about it. Or is that 
going beyond what is sensitive and fair. Have you seen uh, the show Billions? Yes. And I, I know who you're talking about. She's a performance coach. This is where you, as the leader, can make a conscious decision on the environment that you want to create. So if you are vulnerable enough and take the risk to say, this is important to me, you can either be part of this company and work with a little bit of awareness and understand the impact you cause by your behaviors and make some changes, or maybe this company isn't a fit for you, right? Because this is happening on your watch, Sean. So if you look the other way, then your, your silence is complicity. And as Jimmy Carter said, uh, silence is violence. And so to look the other way when women are at the affect of toxic bro culture in companies, that has to change. And it's not that these guys may not be aware of it. Maybe they are, but give them the opportunity to change their tune. No easy answers. You talked a little bit about when you first start talking to people. If you come across hesitancy from one of these groups you're talking to to change, what do you do to handle that? Usually what you're referring to occurs in a training setting, unless where they have willingly come to learn and they've been encouraged to voice what they're struggling with or whatever the case may be. That's one thing. And I'll speak to that in a second. It's another, if it's a conversation series and people you know, are hesitant, regardless, I seek to understand what's the story you're making up about this. What's your fear, right? What do you think might happen? And I don't go too far down that path. And I can tell a quick story. I was working with a CPA firm to high net worth individuals. And the women um, were going to be doing a women's retreat. And they thought it would be a good idea for the men to do a men's retreat. And they asked me if I'd come in and talk to the men. So I go in there and I'm like, if I'm not careful, I'm walking into a trap. So I walked in, sat down with a couple of male decision makers. And I very wisely said, so what do you think of this idea of a men's retreat? And they just went, Blah. This is stupid. I mean, all of the answers. Why would we do this? You know, so I just let them barf it out. And I said, okay, great. I'm glad you got it out. So now, if you were to do something just together as a group, why would you do it? And what would you do? Got some interesting answers. And guess what? We had a men's retreat, according to them. And so the whole resistance thing, you have to meet the men where they are and get them in the room, per se, and give them a chance to be heard. So what were some of the things that they had said? Everything's fine. We don't have any issues. What are they complaining about? Why do we have to do this? Or this is not my cup of tea. You know, I'm not into this. Some guys would be would be silent. Things are fine the way they are. They didn't have a clue. So just like putting up a wall because it's not manly to talk about your feelings kind of a thing? You could say that. You know, and when we've gone into corporate and we've done a couple of interviews prior to a training, as an example. And we had calls set up with men and women, one hour calls. After 20 minutes, the men were hanging up and they were like, this is a meritocracy, everything's fine, gotta go. When you ask the women, you know, they'd say, men are, are, are promoted based on potential. We're told we need training. There's a whole bunch of things and it's not a meritocracy, it's a boys club. We put together a slide that said the tale of two companies and we put it in front of the room of men, but before that, the CEO of a large news agency. And you saw four or five bullet points for the men and then this long list of women. And when we showed this to the men in the room, we heard, oh my God, I had no idea. What do I do? Right? So it's about educating them uh, without shame or blame as to what's going on as a result of them, near them, because of them. And once they come into contact with that, empathy muscles start to get exercised. That's when they say, I want to do something. What can I do? Which is what we're looking for. I'm glad you said muscle. I did a podcast many years ago. And in that episode, I talked about how your brain is like a muscle. And if you are someone who is fearful and you want to not be fearful about a certain thing, 
you have to find a way to kind of dip your toe into that thing that makes you fearful and just get used to it and get comfortable with it. And the more you do it, the more you feel comfortable, the more confident you are. And now this thing, which was a fear is now a strength. And it's because your brain is a muscle and the more you use it in that regard, the more you strengthen its ability to handle that thing specifically. So I very much love your your mention of it being a muscle because it absolutely is. And a lot of people don't seem to realize that your brain is very powerful and you are very powerful and you are capable of changing your brain very, very easily if you want to at any age. It's not just the brain muscle. It's this muscle of connecting to your emotions. I talk about a conscious partnership of the head and the heart. So if men were never taught that feelings are in your body, that if I asked a man, if I asked you and you felt afraid, where do you feel fear in your body? Most men will put a hand on their stomach or their throat, or if they're angry in their hands, or if they're sad, they're going to feel it here. Just answering that question and going through and answering that and using that muscle of your head being aware and your heart acknowledging the feeling, that's a good thing. So there's a number of muscles that we're really trying that have always been there that men just weren't taught. It's totally possible. I present masculine. I'm 6'4", tall. But when I start talking about my emotions, they're like, what's he doing? And it's easy for me. It's actually my vulnerability is one of my superpowers because I will go. I'm not afraid to do it. And I know that when I do it, it makes it possible for other men to do the same. I recently published an episode number 86 with the guest Sarah Raymond. And she runs a YouTube channel with over 600,000 followers. And they talk about mindfulness and meditation and yoga and things like that. Our episode was about connecting emotion with logic. Because oftentimes, particularly, you know, male entrepreneurs, they think they don't feel. I believe that women are better leaders than men because they intuitively feel through their work and therefore the companies they build, the products they build, the the things they do are better, which was actually proven. There was a study done looking at public companies on the Australian Stock Exchange where uh, female-led companies, female CEOs generated 50% more profit than their male counterparts. You know, I feel very confident about having women in our leadership team and all that. Well, it's good to have a different perspective, you know, of them. So what uh, Sarah was saying was that she tries to help people learn to live below the neck, basically, because people are stuck living above the neck. I bet you didn't know this vast arena of real estate below your chin, your body is where your feelings are, and it's uncharted territory. So I, I often refer to that. Did you go on the retreat with those men? I led the retreat. So what was the result after that retreat and, and during it? One of the results was that I am now coaching all of the partners, men included, around accountability, around what drives their behaviors and the importance of them to know thyself so that they can have effective communication and relationships and be effective leaders inside their organization. That was four or five years ago, and I'm still working with them. And so what's happening is all of these wonderful human beings are becoming more emotionally literate and more powerful and impactful as leaders. And that's starting to trickle downhill to the staff and the managers. Yeah, I really wish schools would be empowered to teach these things because I feel like I didn't learn anything in school other than like how to be social. But, you know, the things that my parents taught me were like financial literacy, emotional intelligence, how to pack your luggage so you can go on vacation properly and not waste resources. Like my parents taught me some really valuable things, but my school didn't really teach me anything. And and I feel like a lot of the problems we have start when we're young, they start with our families. And if the school was there to kind of balance it out and be like, hey, actually, like, you know, you should probably do it like this. Or like, you know, if kids were taught how to meditate in school, imagine that. Hey, kids, let's let's take 20 minutes before the start of the day and let's meditate together. Funny enough, actually, in ninth grade, I had a drama class as an elective and our drama teacher would make us do meditation once in a while. And he would turn off the lights and he'd turn on some music and he would have us meditate together. And it was fantastic. Fantastic. So I think everybody should be doing that. That's kind of a, my own tangent there. Yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree with you more. So is there anything we haven't mentioned that you want to bring up? There's been a lot of attention on white men. And there's a faction of white men that feel like all this attention on white men over the last 12 to 18 months is a distraction. And what I would say to those men is, is to be open to the possibility that what has you say that is a combination of your unexamined privilege. And by the way, privilege is not 
a demonized word. It just means that you have advantages. And to be open to the possibility that if you think about it, if you think about the question, how do I want to be experienced by other people and how do I want to contribute to everyone feeling, uh, having a true sense of belonging and, and inclusion at companies, then maybe you can start to make some choices. Uh, and rather than feeling threatened, you can make a shift to taking something that you uniquely have that others don't and shifting the experiences of a lot of other people in your company. And the other thing I would say is to men in general, it's our time, it's our turn to come together for the sake of our families, our friends, whether they are women or marginalized folk, and to use this power, to use this privilege, to use the, our platforms to shift things so that the majority can start to control the narrative instead of the minority. So it's an invitation on my part and a call because I can't do this by myself. So that leads me to the perfect segue. How can people follow up with you? So there's a couple ways. Um, they can go to uh, rayarata.com and that's got plenty of info for my services. Um, they can go to showingup.com to buy the book or go on Amazon. If your listeners go to showingup.com, we have a bonus there that they, they'll get a complimentary virtual ticket to the Better Man conferences. We're doing two this year, one in June in New York and one in San Francisco in November. And they could also go to bettermanconference.com and sign up for our newsletter because we're going to be doing a monthly series and it'll just keep them informed. So much of what I've been talked about today, uh, it'll give credence. Blogs come out occasionally. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. If you like this episode, definitely reach out to Ray. And don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself and your team every day and they'll take care of you too. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. 